Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 553. Science Faction, stop cow gas with seaweed. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of the Fast and Furious uh, sequel titles are, um, I don't know if they roll (laughs) off the tongue. I don't know if their marketing department is trying something new, um, but I don't know if I want to see it as much as I want a Hobbs and Shaw, just sight unseen, just on the title alone. They could no longer afford to get either The Rock or Vin Diesel, nor Ludacris, but they did bring back Ja Rule. <laughs> ja Rule and Jack Black star in <laughs> Fast and Furious 24. Cow gas or something. Oh, dear. Speaking of cow gas, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. And, and you know, nothing against Jack Black. I, I, yeah, I, I did mean to shit on Ja Rule. I just don't think mm-hmm. he would be a great addition to the uh, uh, FF franchise. No, I mean, again, not necessarily addition. He's already been there right we talked about this a few episodes i don't know how we keep talking about fast and furious on this show but a few episodes we talked about how he was actually in the first one and they had to make the age-old decision that you have to make when you're you know seeing two women and you have to decide which one you're gonna settle down with and you have to you know you wonder if you make the right one they decided do we want to settle with jaw rule or ludicrous and i think they chose well yeah, well, I mean, you had your choice between, like, who are we going to build this franchise around? On one hand, we can uh-huh. go with Scarlett Johansson. But on the other uh-huh. hand, and then in to draw the jaw rule parallel, we could go with Casey Anthony. I don't know who we're going to base this Marvel <laughs> franchise on, but... <laughs> did Jaw Rule kill a child? Is that what you're hinting at? Jaw Rule's music did more damage. Casey Anthony ended one child's life, but if you portion out the damage that Jaw Rule did <laughs> individually, it comes out to one Casey Anthony's worth of child crime. Oh, dear. Uh, for all of you guys out there who are wondering where our second episode is, you got to hear Paige Wesley dominate I Call BS for free on the main feed. We I, did I add to that, that on episode, there. I, way, Bobby, and I, I, I really yeah. got to give it to you. You know, even the ones where she got right. I know Paige. I know she didn't uh-huh. hear the hints, but just the ones she got right. So is it science or bad science? <laughs> And I could hear that she wasn't even listening to you and your blatant cheating. But my God, cheating. that trail of breadcrumbs cheating. you left. Yes, you. Pa- huh. I would never accuse Paige, we- Paige Wesley of cheating. But I will accuse you of cheating till the cows come home. Oh, my gosh. This is embarrassing for you. This is yeah, really? uh, this is poor losership <laughs> really? if I've ever seen one. <laughs> this is. You're like Donald Trump uh, at the White House press corps. Uh, talk, like I've, I'm a reporter who's asked, a, who's asked a legitimate question. Your pants have fallen down. A diaper with feces trickling down your leg in front of everybody. But you're like, sad. I'm going to feel really embarrassed for you. For those of you guys listening who are like, man, I miss I Call BS. Where is that? That's actually still around. That is on our Patreon feed. You can look up Robert Timothy on Patreon where you'll find the I Call BS episodes every single week. And they are fantastically fun. I will say that for those of you who are wanting to feel that elation that you felt listening to Paige Fox finally win, a comedian finally win in Paige Wesley, you will not hear that in the I Call BS feed, because Damien still, believe it or not, refuses to win this game. I don't know if I'm willing to take shit from somebody who named the Patreon account after himself and not the podcast. (laughs) I don't know if those are the actions of a man who wants a Patreon to succeed or the actions of a man who is a fairly functioning adult with a learning disability. I don't know. Those are both the same... To be fair, those were the actions of a man who is far too old to be doing things online in the podcasting world. I'm a paper and pencil type of guy. (laughs) Exactly. So if you want to support this podcast, please write a letter to your postman and sending a check to Robert (laughs) Timothy. Man, I don't get why this podcast model has to take it off. How come the dollars aren't flowing in? (laughs) Bobby, um, how is Operation Placing Barriers in front of Patreons, people who want to give us money? How's that operation working out? I don't know. I think you're heading up that operation with your refusal to win I call. (laughs) Yes, I think that's pretty much a unanimous decision of the crowd, of myself, of everybody on the internet who, who like sent messages after the Paige Wesley episode. Oh my God, it was so good to hear a comedian finally try for once. I'm so happy that somebody is putting effort towards this. Why is it that Damien continues to to just try not to win every single episode? By the way, um, I, I only 
actually spent time calling out the subtle cheating that you did in that episode, not the mm-hmm. very real cheating you did at the end of the episode. But by very real cheating, do you mean allowing somebody on who's actually going to try? I am proud that Paige Wesley has an accomplishment on this show, and that is being the only comedian that Bobby has allowed to complete his gauntlet. He was never going to allow any comedian to complete the gauntlet by design. To shit on Damien properly, one comedian has to be able to run through for spite reasons. Yeah, by trying. Also, a quick shout out to a good fan of ours, Aaron, uh, who was able to come and see us on at least one of our nerd nights who had a week that's harder than anyone should ever have. We feel for you, Aaron. Uh, Hope the episode makes you feel a little bit better. So for now, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, article number one. How to stop cow gas with seaweed. Uh, What you do is you form the seaweed into a cork or a plug. Mm. But remember, you're fitting a cow. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need a thick, girthy plug. And that's about it. You're saying just a butt plug for cows. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, it's kind of like if you're a young Dutch boy and you want to stop your homeland from being flooded, (laughs) you got to plug your, put your finger in the hole. Well, scientifically, we're not doing something that much different. We got to put our fist or a child's head into the cow's butt. I was going to say, couldn't we just get a bunch of young Dutch boys to go and and just put a finger in there? I mean, I think a young boy's neck is what is going to be the proper girth to seal that up. So I think what we're going to need to do is rig up some sort of scuba apparatus onto young Dutch boys' heads and then shove them into a cow. Now, Damien, as we've talked about before, it's actually a misnomer to say it's cow farts that cause the methane eruption. They actually mainly burps. Cows are actually burping for the main part to release that methane. So uh, real quick background. We've talked about this a whole bunch about how cows impact climate change. So cows are a significant contribution to methane production, methane being 26 to 30 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2. And so, you know, a little bit of methane goes a long way, so to speak. And cows are a huge source of that methane, specifically industrial farming and the cows that are coming along with it. Basically, these cows are constantly, it's I, I, we already commented, thought to be farting, actually really burping out so much methane that they are literally warming the planet. And with 1.5 billion, with a B, cows on this planet, that is a shit ton, excuse the pun, of methane that is constantly being released into the atmosphere. If you have ever driven through cow country, you know, if you've ever driven through a par- portion of your state or uh, county that uh, is big into agriculture, I think it's pretty easy to see why most people would think it was gas yeah. from the rear as opposed to the front. I guess, what are farmers doing for their cow's oral hygiene if their entire species smells like a, a breath, smells like butt? <laughs> what is PETA doing to get some dental hygienists out there into those fields? Now, to be fair, cow burps are part of their methane distribution. Also, some of it is when they poo, then their poo, just like every other animal's poo, gets digested by microbes, and there is some methane distribution there, too. But right now, we're going to talk about the actual off-gassing that comes out of a cow's mouth when it burps. And it is, again, it is really significant. The amount of methane this produces is dramatic. And since methane is such a powerful greenhouse gas, the overall effects on the Earth itself is dramatic. So a really interesting paper came out of UC Davis this week. For those of you guys who don't know, it is the University of California's agriculture school. It's their like agricultural flagship. And so they have a whole bunch of cows, like it's where they you produce cows and veterinarians and stuff like that. What they did is looked at mixing a small amount of seaweed within a cow's diet to see the effects. Now some background research. We have known before that if you fed cows just like this seaweed based diet, it basically drew dramatically cuts down on their methane emissions, uh, sometimes as much as like 85 to 95 percent. The problem is getting cows underwater to graze for long periods of time. (laughs) That's right. You know, you think it's getting them to wear the snorkel and the goggles, but they actually do that willingly. The real problem is that the gangs of manatees will come up and it's like (laughs) Crips versus Bloods. (laughs) uh, Your average Texas Longhorn, while formidable online, 
gets a yeah. bitch slapping by a manatee underwater. Yeah, absolutely. The real problem is they won't eat it. They don't like the taste of seaweed. So they're not going to eat a seaweed-based diet. So we basically went, hey, look, we could feed cows seaweeds and it would totally cut down on methane. And then we tried it and we're like, fuck. These are some unhappy cows. Yeah. And so we had the kind of the background research. Well, what this group did is instead of feeding them seaweed, they actually just mixed a rather small amount of seaweed into their food. We're talking about 80 grams a day, which is a tiny percentage of their overall grain intake. And you mix that in there and it cut down the cow's methane emissions by 82%. And what's happening is basically this is an inhibiting an enzyme within the cow's stomach that is producing a lot of this methane. And we found you don't need to feed them the whole diet. You feed them their regular diet with a little bit of this mixed in. By the way, a side note on this particular article, which I loved is they said there was no discernible difference in the taste of the feed with this 80 grams mixed in, which means some grad student is just constantly eating a mixture of cow grains and seaweed to see if they can detect a difference. Uh, this sounds it's like commercials for Diet Coke used to imply that the gap between Diet Coke, not Coke Zero, but Diet Coke and regular Coke was much closer than it was. I don't know if they're getting that scientist to say that this feed, like, did they ask a cow? I want a cow scientist's opinion. What about those Chick-fil-A cows? Can we ask them? And you might ask, well, is this inhibiting their ability to digest it all since you're stopping this enzyme? And the research showed the cows gained just as much weight on this diet. They just produced 82% less methane, which is gigantic. This is a real world solution to a problem that is huge worldwide, literally world threatening. And this is something that is not going to cost a lot of money or, you know, have a problem of getting the cows not to eat it. 80 grams mixed into cow feed is very, very little. Seaweed is very cheap to, to manufacture. In fact, we have to have kelp cutters here off the coast of San Diego to take out all the seaweed because otherwise it washes up on the beach and the tourists complain. So we literally have these ships that go back and forth and just cut the kelp out. And we could just take a small percentage of this and use this to literally save the world so wait i'm a san diego native i'd known that they cut kelp out in the kelp forest mm -hmm. but i had yeah. thought that it had some manufacturing or industrial purpose they just do it so that kids like myself don't go ew seaweed on the beach as a kid that's literally the only reason they cut the forest no i mean they use it they use it too but there is places where plenty of seaweed grows and they just let it grow but here it's like well it's gonna wash up on the beaches and rot away and also it gets in the way of boats and stuff like that and so yeah we i mean it certainly has its industrial uses that they then utilize it for it attracts nuisance otters if you don't cut it your, your ocean just become overrun with ocean otters <laughs> Yeah, that's why some people like the gentrification that comes with kelp cutting. You get rid of those otters. <laughs> Less otters, more yachtists. Yachters. I don't know. I've I've never actually seen a yacht. I don't know what you'd call somebody who owns a yacht. <laughs> White. <laughs> now, really interesting. And here's the thing. I found almost no reporting on this story, which is crazy to me as somebody who is consummately concerned with climate change and global warming and the emission of greenhouse gases. The fact that we have literally just found a quick, easy, and dirt cheap way to eliminate probably the major artificial source, because there are natural sources of methane, artificial source of methane on this planet, and it didn't make any fucking news stories is beyond me. And it, by the way, continues to convince me that we do not do a good enough job of science communication because this should have been on the front page of every fucking news site in the country, and yet it's buried in the back of, like, Science Focus magazine. It's definitely not penis. Call me when you get to penis. <laughs> Uh, what percentage of methane do pigs and will... Not not nearly as much. So these are ruminants usually. These are animals that that have the four-chambered stomachs and, and do this type of work. So yes, all animals will produce some amount of methane because their poo will disintegrate. Essentially, they'll be taken out by microbes, even humans, and that will produce methane. So all animals, even, even by the way, plants as they're being eaten by microbes produce methane. All of that is true. Cows produce a significant amount of methane because of the fact that they have these four chambered stomachs that essentially digest things like grasses like a pig can't eat grass pig's not going to live on grass pigs eat food scraps they live on ass know what i'm talking about yeah <laughs> high five <laughs> Uh, but a cow does. And the reason the way a cow is able to do that is by having these complex four chambered stomachs that use enzymes and methanogens to break down that grass into something that then produces a bunch of methane. So cows are a uniquely bad source of this, though 
all animals and for, to some extent plants will produce methane in their life cycle. Please beyond meat. I'm weak. Please have a a beyond meat substitute that allows me to break my addiction to cow and their <laughs> global warming causing ways. Well, honestly, there's things, you know, we've talked about destroying the Brazilian rainforest and stuff. So even if you're treating, you're doing stuff right with cows, there's still going to be, you know, environmental destruction and they're pooing everywhere and they're taking up grain that could otherwise be eaten. It doesn't completely eliminate it. But honestly, if you look at this, this dramatically reduces like what I would call the overall guilt or the overall damage you are doing by eating red meat. And if we could get this to be widespread throughout you know, cow farming, agricultural pastoralism and stuff, this could make a huge difference in our overall greenhouse gas emission. It's really something that I, I am shocked. I am literally shocked is not an incredibly important story going on right now. Meanwhile, it's like, hey, Biden fell down while walking up some stairs. It's like, motherfucker, this could change the earth forever. I will never understand why that is a story after the last four years. I'm like, oh, uh, we, we got Gerald Ford again. Oh, crazy. We've done, what, How is this a story? All right. On to article number two. Stimulate the clot. I actually don't believe women can clot. I've never seen it. <laughs> and I've been told that this isn't uh, I'm actually burning myself when I say that I can't make a woman clot. <laughs> but <laughs> you show me the science and say it's even possible for a woman to clot. I was pretty excited about my stimulating the clot title, actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. how do I spin with this? OK, how do I run with this metaphor? <laughs> So we're going to talk about something that Damien briefly brought up as part of a joke last week, but certainly was one of the major science stories about both last week and this week, which was the AstraZeneca slash Oxford COVID vaccine halting that went around after it was reported that there was an increased risk of clotting in some people. My, uh, I, as I, we mentioned uh, last week, my wife was part of the AstraZeneca drug trial. I, I believe it's actually mm -hmm. kind of hard to, to find somebody who took the AstraZeneca here in the States, but she was part of a trial. It is. It is. It's, it's, it hasn't, it actually only just recently got approved, but it hasn't actually been distributed yet. And up until recently, wasn't approved for distribution in the United States. That's right. So, uh, yeah, she, so she got her AstraZeneca. Turns out we found out, uh, you know, a little bit after that she was not confirmed that she was not part of the placebo group and so she was walking mm -hmm. around like the cock of the walk miss i've been vaccinated yeah. and uh come to find out about this astrazeneca story and blood clots and everything and um uh -huh. she doesn't know i'm taking out a life insurance policy on her so <laughs> and buying a gun <laughs> oh no the astrazeneca vaccine killed my wife with a headshot <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Headshot. Yeah, Jesus tap. Christ. <laughs> wow, so brutal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> AstraZeneca, uh, I wanted an open casket. We talked about it when I put the hit out. <laughs> so, news came out that there might have been an increased risk of clotting, and a bunch of countries essentially completely halted their distribution of that particular vaccine, including, this is a non-comprehensive list, Sweden, Latvia, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Denmark, Normandy, Norway, the Netherlands, Ireland, Luxembourg, Cyprus, Portugal, Slovenia, Indonesia, Bulgaria, Thailand, Romania, Iceland, and Austria. Yeah, but a country anybody's ever heard of. Name one. France? <laughs> yeah, Italy? No, you, named, you named a good percentage Germany? of the world's population. I yeah, mean, I, I did. And, and the European GDP. In fact, almost yeah. 100% of European <laughs> Essentially, GDP. Essentially, yeah. Yeah, when you include the UK, yeah, you're right. So uh, there was a huge halt, and basically that was met with a lot of skepticism from the medical community, and I want to explain why that is. Now, what ended up happening, and this was the background for the story that broke about the potential for increased risk of clot, out of 17 million people vaccinated in the European Union and the UK, there were about 470 reports of blood clots in the days after getting the shot. That sounds like it might be concerning, but this is why understanding population demographic information is important. Question, what percentage of people had open wounds? I mean, I expect blood clotting if, you know, but if, That's if right. like how many people just cut themselves washing the dishes? Yeah, these are more like thrombosis, but... <laughs> what you have to do is compare this to the background number of people developing clots in daily life. Meaning, you know, if somebody's walking around and they have an X percentage chance of developing a blood clot, then it doesn't matter if they happen to get the vaccine beforehand. You know, it's just X percentage chance. It kind of reminds me, I always think about this when I hear these arguments is uh, there's like a family guy line where he's like, oh no, we're not buying a car from the newspaper. I knew a guy who bought a car from the newspaper and then 10 years later, bam, herpes. You know, and like, 
<laughs> that's, that's good. I mean, I've been lost. I heard that joke. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and like, there is that thing where we, we are looking for correlations and we find them even when they're not there. Because, you know, if your friend is the one who ends up getting a clot and it happens to be just after the shot, of course you're going to make that association. And if you don't know the background rate of clotting and stuff, that could seem very compelling until you look at the population numbers. So, so wait, is it possible that, uh, that a non-British physician was in the hospital like, oh my God, these blood clot numbers are out of control until a British physician, oh no, I'm sorry, those are just simply healthy British veins doing their business. Let me assure you <laughs> that there's nothing untoward here. Well, you have to look at it. And when we did kind of a retrospective analysis looking at everybody, you basically say, okay, what is the population who got the shot? What is the likelihood of any given person, sh you know, no shot, getting a blood clot in that time span? And then does it look like there's more? And basically it doesn't. Now, there are a few of those 470 cases, specifically ones in some younger people that are higher than the background number, but it's still incredibly small. We're talking about the background number of those, you know, 17 million people. We would expect one such case and we found four or five such cases. Those men were Welsh and suffering from many ailments that had nothing to do with the AstraZeneca vaccine, simply from soccer hooliganism. Seems like a fourfold increase, right? Which could be a lot. But when you're dealing with such small numbers, a lot of times this is within a standard deviation because, you know, the difference between one and four is not that big. Now, a few things. It might actually represent a much higher number. It might be, you know, well outside of the range that we would expect. And that could also have nothing to do with the vaccine because it could also be that these people unknowingly were already infected with COVID. They hadn't shown symptoms so that nobody knew they had COVID. And as we know, COVID is a clotting disease. My, uh, just as a side note, my grandmother actually got COVID a couple weeks ago and she ended up developing a horrible blood clot in her leg that ended up almost killing her. It was a big deal. COVID is a clotting disease. The reason it keeps you from breathing and suffocates you isn't because it's damaging your lungs necessarily or filling your lungs up with fluid like pneumonia is. It's literally clotting up up the alveoli holes that you use to breathe. So at its essence, COVID is a clotting disease. And if only a few of these people, small percentage of these people unknowingly had COVID, then we would expect a higher number or a higher percentage than average of people developing clots. People listening, just because Bobby has a grandmother who is alive and he is telling the truth, that grandmother's daughter is in Bobby's mom is insanely old. So when yes. Bobby's telling me that his grandmother has survived, she's 96, she's 96. I have seen her survive an evil Knievel esque jump in a wheelchair uh, that would That's have true. killed me. That would have yes. that would have shattered every bone in my body. But this 94 year old on my wedding day, when my mom accidentally let her wheelchair go down a very steep hill. It's it's a funny story, even in the telling, but like if you're there, and especially even if you're Bobby, you his heart jumped through his chest, but on his wedding day, there is a comically steep hill, like something out of a, yeah. out of a ramp, something like Tony Hawk would do if you were going to jump 13 buses. Yeah. And Bobby's mom, because she is old and senile, uh, presumably, <laughs> uh, thought it was okay to let go of her mother while on this hill, and she was in a wheelchair. Long story short, uh, we all thought we see Bobby's grandmother speeding down a hill, thinking, oh, well, there's going to be a funeral before this wedding. Turns out she yeah. just dusts herself off. Well, not just speeding down a hill, speeding down a hill at like 20 miles an hour, hitting a bump, and then flying out of the wheelchair, airborne, and then crashing into the ground. Uh, again, this was at, I don't know, 92 uh, years old, <laughs> and not a healthy 92, and, 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 and just smashing into the ground. And also, by the way, this wasn't like midnight on the night of my wedding after we'd all been dancing and party. This is like nine minutes after I exchanged my vows and I'm watching this and going, well, I guess my grandmother just died. I, I just <laughs> married. What a great feeling. And I guess my grandmother's dead. Nope. But it turns out uh, at the point of this story was that, uh, so your grandmother's immortal. And I think that's yeah. the science story we need to be talking about. She survived the siege of Budapest. She survived the invasion of the Nazis. She And then the what she described as much, much worse, which was the invasion of the Red Army and the occupation for the next like 12 or 14 years of the Soviets. And you know it's bad when they go, the Nazis came and it was bad. And then they left and things got worse. I would love it if at the, your grandmother's last words to you were, of all the things that have happened to me in my life, you were the most disappointing and worst. <laughs> no, she loves me. I'm the best. <laughs>
But anyway, like I said, it is a clotting disease at its base. And so if even a small percentage of these people did not realize they were already infected with COVID, got the shot, but still had the effects of COVID, we would expect to have more clots than your typical background population noise. But here's the deal. Let's say it wasn't the case. Let's say the AstraZeneca actually did cause these extra three or four clots. They still should never have suspended it. You are still talking about a what would have equated to like a death or two and maybe as many as like seven deaths, maybe. Whereas if you look at how many lives are saved with those 17 million inoculations, you are talking about a number that is in the, you know, five digits. So we are looking at this all wrong. And this is a problem that we as people have with an inability to understand the statistical realities of the world. This happened with Vioxx, where we discovered there was like a higher chance of heart attack. In reality, taking Vioxx off the market because that's a higher chance of heart attack probably killed tens of thousands of people since it's been off the market because its ability to lower cholesterol would have saved that many more people. We see this all the time. Everything we do is a risk benefit, right? Every kind of intervention has some sort of risk. Your doctor could tell you exercise is good. You're right. But a certain percentage of people exhaust themselves to death every single year exercising. Tylenol helps pain, but it can cause serious damage with shockingly small amount over the recommended dosage sometimes even under the recommended dosage. Every year, people literally die from overdoses of water. So there is like no such thing as an intervention that has no negative downsides. And if the negative downsides is literally possibly, we don't even know, possibly seven deaths versus the tens of thousands of lives it would literally save being deployed, this halting of this vaccine in these 17 plus countries has not only killed a certain amount of people who will then get the virus, it will also kill more people who then get the virus further down the line from those people who now are getting it who otherwise would have been immune. This is a exercise in the futility and stupidity of human beings and their inability to understand statistics on large numbers. This sounds no different to me than the carotene gambit. You are taking a risk. Every intervention has a risk, but you weigh that risk. Uh -huh. Sometimes you got to choke yourself out. Yeah. By preventing autoerotic asphyxiation, how many mm -hmm. deaths by lame orgasm are you committing the population to? <laughs> We talked about a study a while ago, which I still love to reference, where they like literally broke down how many lives a year get saved by DUI crashes. And it was like, wait, how does that work? And it's like, yes, obviously there's more deaths per year from DUI. We should stop DUI. But if you want to like be honest with the math, you have to account for a few things. Number one, a DUI crash means that that drive, however long it was going to be, is now shorter because you were going to drive home. It was five miles. You crash one mile into it. That means your drive is now four miles shorter. And every mile driven, even while sober, has a certain risk of death to it. And so there's a certain amount of people who don't die in fatal non-alcohol related car accidents because they were too drunk and crashed into a tree and maybe broke an arm before they could actually make it home. And every time you have like husband and wife around each other, there is a certain amount of domestic violence that happens. And also that is a fatal thing sometimes. And so there is a certain amount of people, like if they would have gotten home, they would have beaten their wife to death that night, but they crashed the car and so they don't. And so it ends up lowering. So like, even though it seems weird, technically DUIs save a much smaller percentage than they cost, but save a few lives every year. I think it also depends on the street you're on. Uh, in fact, this week, uh, uh, right next to my house, actually made national news. A guy was driving home drunk early in the morning. And because we have this portion of San Diego where you've confined all the homeless people into like this one yes. uh, sidewalk underneath a bridge, this guy could have statistically fallen asleep at the wheel and veered off the road and onto the sidewalk most places in the city and yeah. been fine. But because especially because nobody around here walks. But especially because he did it right here in this one homeless caravan city, it created a slaughter field. So yeah, if that guy had wandered off the road just a mile before, you could have prevented nine DUI deaths. Yeah. If he was if he was drunk enough, he could have crashed before he hit all those homeless people. Yeah. So this is one of those things that is just, you know, it's we don't understand the numbers involved. So I want to reiterate to you that if you can, you can only get one shot in AstraZeneca because there, go get it. You are not going to die from a clot. Or let me just say this. You are statistically much, 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 much more likely to die from the disease itself and possibly kill somebody else further down the line in the train of transmission than you are to die of any kind of blood clot. Do your part. Help stop this pandemic. Go get your shot. Do you think the reason that the public wasn't upset that the Johnson & Johnson or any of the Moderna or any of the other American-made vaccines, do you think the reason that Americans didn't misinterpret this data and get those vaccinations pulled is because Americans don't care if other Americans die? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of our that's kind of our mo. They were like, "Hey, I, I was going to shoot that guy later in a mass shooting anyway. What do I care?" Oh, so this, so you're not taking the vaccine because of the blood clot risks? But what risks? Nah, it's a, it's a hoax. That's the difference to the American people not taking it and the British. All right. Thank you, audience, for listening to Science Faction 553, where you learned all about how to stop cow gas with seaweed and how to stimulate the clot. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 554. Hello, it is I, a Dutch boy. Can I remove my head from this cow now? I'm sorry for sounding German. You've been listening to Science Faction. That's not right.